Hi everyone, welcome to the last day of this series of 10 on 10 where we are discussing 10 questions for the upcoming NEET PG and FMG exam. I've made a playlist on my channel which has all these 10 sessions. Also today, once we are done with this, I will be sharing a compiled PDF of all the 10 sessions over Telegram and the link for Telegram group and channel are posted in the description below. So let's get going with this. First question over here is the trickiest one where we have a labeled image for a testing that is performed and they have asked you that which of the following hemolytic anemias is this done for? Now I know the immediate instinct that comes to your mind and you want to answer is PNH because you think this is peroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria thinking I've given you red color urine but if you read carefully I gave you blood sample and not urine sample. If this is a reddish and brownish color blood sample and not urine sample you can't think of PNH at the outset. This is actually a case of G6PD deficiency but how because this is a test that is being performed and this question is only important for neat PG aspirants the name of this test is the met hemoglobin reduction test is this done nowadays no it is not nowadays for G6PD deficiency we directly look out for G6PD levels in the blood but early in the day when G6PD assays were not available they used to do a test called the met hemoglobin reduction test all of us know the basic function of G6PD till the time G6PD is normal, you know, because we add some chemicals in this test. If I add chemicals in the blood, the color of my blood will change. The color of my blood will become brown, but then who will come to my rescue? The G6PD will come to my rescue and it will say, no, no other chemicals are allowed here. I will bring the color back to red and then after some time, my blood will come back to red because I have normal G6PD. So in the end, if you get red color blood, after changing colors, the blood comes back to its original color. This means G6PD has done its job. However, if the brown color would have persisted and that is what is met hemoglobin, that would have told you that G6PD has not done its job and that is G6PD deficient. So over here, if it is a blood sample, think of this assay. Yeah, if this would have been a urine sample with red color urine, I would have also probably thought of PNH. Moving on to question number two, I have kept a easy question after a tricky one. Find the correct match and this could be a multiple choice. Let's start reading. Fragile X syndrome, CTG not happening at all because fragile X syndrome is CGG repeats. Myotonic dystrophy, we always read with a T in the center. So CTG, this seems to be correct. Huntington disease, we studied hunting in a cage. So this also seems to be correct. Frederick's ataxia, we've learned friend gana ga raha hai. So GAA repeats, this is correct. So finally, this is a multiple choice question where B, C and D, all of these happen to be the correct options. Moving on to question 3 and uh, the hemat question back to it. What is the common gene mutated in hereditary serocytosis? If you would have read this much, you would have gone in for N-chirin, but you had to stop. The question over here is autosomal recessive. This is also another multiple choice question before you start attempting. See, the most common mutation in hereditary serocytosis without a doubt is going to be N-chirin, which I'll mark over here in the RBC membrane because most of the HS are autosomal dominant, roughly 75%. There's a very less proportion of hereditary serocytosis, which is autosomal recessive, and we know these happen to be the more severe disorders. The severe ones are because of of a mutation of spectrin. Now, if you look carefully, there are two chains of spectrin over here, alpha spectrin and beta spectrin, both of which can be mutated in order to cause autosomal recessive hereditary spherocytosis. Moving on to question four over here, coming again back to him at, there's a 14 year old boy with complaints of fever, malaise and bone pain. Whenever they give you a peripheral smear of someone who's a young child with bone pains, always think of sickle cell anemia. Yes, you can see something that is looking like sickle cells, but let me read further. They have said peripheral smear shows microcytic hypochromic and normocytic normochromic. So basically peripheral smear immediately did not show you sickle cells. So you did some special test. On adding a certain chemical, there is a blood picture that they have shown after 8 hours in which definitely everyone can see the sickle cell. So what chemical has been added? The answer is sodium dithionide. Please note, if on a peripheral smear, you directly end up seeing sickle cells, that is a clear cut case of sickle cell anemia and there's no doubt. However, some patients will not show you sickle cells because do you know why does sickle cell anemia occur? And that's one of the updates. It occurs because of a mutation at the beta chain where glutamic acid is replaced by valine. And we have always learned that glutamic acid can go and valine is welcome. So we know that what is going and then what is 
coming so valine is coming earlier they used to say this happens at beta 6 position now it is said that this happens at beta 7 position because the way of numbering has changed so this is an update that you have to know but that doesn't mean that everyone with this particular mutation 24 7 will keep showing me these kind of cells normally everyone has cells which look round or probably biconcave which is the normal shape However, even in sickle cells, many a times patients are showing you cells which are of this shape. It is only when the oxygen goes down or the pH goes down, basically hypoxia or acidosis, that is when the shape will change to sickle. Does that change uh, of shape happen in you and I in a hypoxic condition? No, because we don't have the mutation. People who have the mutation, if they suffer any hypoxia or acidosis, their cells will change. So if the patient was currently in a case of hypoxia, acidosis, his cell shape would have looked like this. If he's not, he might have given you cells this way then how will you you know cells are trying to hide they are not showing their real colors of sickle cells then ma'am i will be doing the sickling test what is sickling test we will take one drop of blood which i have already added over here to that i will add a chemical and the name of that chemical is two percent sodium metabisulfite can be added or two percent sodium diethionite can be added either of the two and that is the answer over here reason for that because these tend to extract all the oxygen they will create a hypoxic situation but ma'am there is all air around if you don't seal this particular blood sample so you will now put a cover slip and all the ends have to be sealed so that no air can come in it is a true hypoxic condition how should i seal it i am going to put a lot of wax over here where should i get wax from in the lab ma'am i am just an intern i don't even know where wax is kept or maybe they say wax is out of stock it's not there how should i seal it then you're working in a path lab which usually has more women around some or the other will have a nail polish or nail paint in their bag so you can actually seal it with nail polish or nail paint the concept is to create a barrier that no air should be able to come in either ways as soon as you put that sodium dithionite or metabisulfite you are gonna get those sickle cells and the sickling test then comes out to be positive so option a is the answer Moving on to question 5, a very lengthy question. But if I had to be smart out here and go through just quick buzzwords that I can, I would have seen that flow cytometry, something is written, absent expression of CD55 and CD59. Well, that becomes a case of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Is this patient showing hemoglobinuria? Yes, there is a coffee color urine and they have clearly mentioned that there is no menstruation going on. So, there is an element of PNH. PNH is a kind of an intravascular hemolysis intravascular hemolysis means the blood is breaking in the blood vessels inside the blood vessels so bilirubin will increase because if blood breaks bilirubin is forming so do i have jaundice in the patient yes i do and look at the hemoglobin the severe severity of anemia it's as severe as four grams everything is fitting in well they've just asked you the treatment they've told you the treatment that is eculizumab they've asked you what could be a complication of the same and that is meningococcus please note that pnh as a disease occurs because cd55 and cd59 are not doing their job and what is their job cd55 and 59 if you see they are preventing all these complements from working so in other words i can say these are going to be controllers of the complement system if i'm saying that they are there this means my complement system is well under control but if they have gone missing there is no one to control my complement system which means the complement system is now going to be uncontrolled an uncontrolled complement system would mean that all the rbcs are now going to be attacked and they would be broken so what should i do for the treatment i can't suddenly get cd55 and 59 but the work that they were doing that i can definitely get and that job is done by the drug eculizumab because eculizumab is something which is now going to basically stop or control the complement system so you can say culizumab is anti c5 anti complement 5 which means it will not let the complement system work further if the complement system will not work further my purpose is solved the patient will not have red color urine at night he will not have pnh but there is one complication and the complication is that by stopping the complement system you have stopped everything that was forming ahead of it ahead of it was formation of mass membrane attack complex that used to kill bacteria. Now if you are giving eculizumab which will not let this pathway work, this means MAC will not form and we have always studied M for M when MAC is not formed, patient is highly prone to meningococcal infection or Neisseria meningitidis which is also a previous year question. If MAC is not formed, the patient is going to be prone to meningococcus Neisseria meningitidis PYQ and that's the answer over here. Okay, so question 5 also done. Moving on to question 6 
objects which is coming to our spotters this is a peripheral smear which has been taken classically at 4 degree this means over here i can see the red blood cells are all making clumps as if they are agglutinating at 4 degree this is the case of cad that is cold because 4 degree agglutinin because i can see that disease cold agglutinin disease temperature is certain but this is because of an antibody that is igm this means this is an autoimmune hemolytic anemia we have studied that autoimmune hemolytic anemia can be warm because that would occur at 37 degree and that is because of antibody igg g for garam so warm aiha the other one is cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia which is further of many types right now i'm keeping it brief so cold agglutinin disease due to igm will be the one that will occur at 4 degree moving on to question 7 here we have a thyroid fnc they are asking you is it adequate or not what is the adequacy criteria well bethesda like in pap smear you have bethesda group of pap smear techniques have been given by them the entire reporting protocol have been given by them so bethesda system has also given thyroid fnc the adequacy says that we will call thyroid fnc adequate if you get at least six groups of cells so let me count vaguely you have to count one two three four five six i can see seven i can see eight so def definitely more than six group of cells i'm seeing in every group you should have at least 10 cells i don't even need to count these are every group definitely more than 10 your dot 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 even if you can't definitely more than 10 in each one of them you don't have to go and sit and count every cluster you can have a vague idea that yeah 6 10 is the protocol if you get six groups of cells and every group has 10 cells in it you are saying that the thyroid fnc is adequate but for neat pg students only is there any exception and that exception is cci if you are seeing any cancerous cell don't wait that i should see six groups and 10 cells even if one cancer cell is seen, you give it. You don't think of adequacy or not. Second, what if you are dealing with colloid goiter or colloid cyst? Over there, you will get a lot of golden color colloid. You won't get so many cells. So, you don't wait for the cells. You give the diagnosis. And the third one is going to be inflammation. Like in a case of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, itis inflammation. Over there, you will not see more of thyroid. You will see more of inflammatory cells like lymphocytes. So, in these three situations, that is CCI, don't wait that my 610 protocol should be fulfilled then you give the diagnosis even if you don't have six groups and 10 cells per group finally coming to question eight over here this has been a previous year neat pg question which many students get wrong they say there is a urinary bladder and usually the same photo is given there is a suspicion of cancer to the urologist reason being that on cystoscopy he saw that there were some yellow mucosal plaques inside so these plaques made him believe that oh maybe this is a cancer in the urinary bladder of course a biopsy was done but on biopsy he did not see any cancer cells he started seeing some bluish color weird bodies that must be signifying calcium what are these calcium bodies known as these are known as michaelis gutman bodies what's the name of this disease melacoplakia please note melacoplakia shows you michaelis gutman bodies made up of calcium what is melacoplakia it is actually a defect in phagocytosis so what you were thinking as cancer is nothing but a defect in phagocytosis i mean this is also a disease but compared with cancer you are happy patient doesn't have cancer and has melacoplakia in those words so remember m for m melacoplasia shows you my achilles gutman bodies coming to the ninth question of the day which of course i've changed the images a little going forward because we are towards the end of the session so you can have tougher images towards the end of the series here you have an adrenal gland mass ma'am we know only one adrenal gland mass and that is pheochromocytoma so let's take a safe guess how did i understand pheochromocytoma because the pattern that i'm seeing of the cells they are arranged in nest and this nesting pattern is a PYQ. This is known as the Zell Balin pattern. Till the time it is an adrenal gland, I call it pheochromocytoma. When it occurs outside the adrenal gland, I call it a paraganglioma. Rest everything there is the same about them, only the site is different. What kind of a tumor is it? It is a neuroendocrine tumor. How do I know? Because over here, a black and white microscopy, electron microscopy shows me these black, black color granules. These are neurosecretory granules. This will tell me that this is a neuroendocrine tumor okay so done with this as well coming to a derma path question we've touched upon a little bit of surgery questions a little bit of gynae so derma was left so what is this a classical pearly white lesion on the nose or near the medial canthus of the eye and i can visualize that there is a dilated blood vessel also going on top telangiectatic even with this much i think this is a case of basal cell carcinoma but how does it look like under the biopsy so over here there are two findings if you look at these cells it looks as if there's a blue color line as if 
they are all parallel arranged after each other they are all parallel to each other so this is referred to as peripheral palisading which would mean that the cells are all in a straight line parallel but that is very difficult to catch okay they are all standing like this but what i see is there is a space created if these are the cells they are standing a little the tissue has become a little away from them so this is a cluster of cell and the tissue has become a little away so this gap is known as the retraction artifact which is a very famous question that you get with basal cell carcinoma and today's homework is all about basal cell carcinoma so here we have basal cell carcinoma question number one does it show you local invasion or distant metastasis you have to tell me second is there any syndrome where you can have bcc and if you know a syndrome then you will also have to tell me the genetic mutation associated with it well on that note the series is completed the pdf of this will be given from day one to day 10 as a compiled pdf will be given to you on telegram and telegram channel and group link there's a channel where only i can post and then there's a group where everyone can have discussion including students posting their doubts channel is something which is more sane because you don't get distracted because only i post so of course i'm not gonna spam you and uh, group is where you can meet all sorts of people as you are already aware of so i've posted both the links you will get the pdf on both of them whichever you are a part of and thank you for being so cooperative and for such an amazing response to this series and for forcing me to continue this series but i'm not continuing this it was labeled 10 on 10 which means it was meant to finish and so it does but i am going to come up with a new series which again i will update on telegram because we also have to start the telegram quizzes so we can't have youtube plus telegram and too much of distraction for you so i will plan it in a way that we have a single activity on a single day it's either a telegram quiz or it is a fill in the blank pdf that i usually give or it is a youtube session so i'll plan that out and i'll be posting it on the telegram with the entire plan Thank you so much for the response and I'm waiting for today's answers as well. Thank you and study well.